Welcome to the special edition of Belmont Journal, Belmont's news show and community update. I'm your host, Shonul Malik. Every 10 years, the US Census conducts its uh, research and all states, including the state of Massachusetts, are constitutionally mandated to change its House, Senate, Governor's Council, and Congressional District boundaries to accommodate shift in population. Based on one person and one vote concept and to provide equal representation to its citizens, the process of redistricting is significant as the way the lines are drawn impacts who runs for public office and who gets elected. Joining us today is Senator Will Brownsberger, Senator of Suffolk, Second Suffolk and Middlesex, including the town of Belmont and helping us understand a little bit more about this process and the most recent results. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are losing a part of your current district, but not Belmont. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. My district changes. Um, my district currently includes Belmont, Watertown, uh, much of Alston and Brighton, and then uh, Fenway and Back Bay, a little bit of the South End. Mm -hmm. And in the redistricting, um, I will lose Back Bay and the parts of the South End that I have and a little bit of uh, Fenway that I have. So it'll be kind of pulling back a little bit and I'll, I'll, in place of that, I'll be gaining the rest of Alston and Brighton, which, which makes a lot of sense. And um, we'll be representing in addition four precincts in Cambridge, in, in West Cambridge. And that if, if you kind of look at the old district versus the new district on the map, you'll see the new district um, is more compact, uh, less, less stretched out. Uh, so it's it's and I think I think it will. I mean, I'm looking forward to to serving the new district as I've enjoyed serving the current district. I've I've, I've loved I've loved I love my district and I and I look forward to loving my my new district. Uh, Senator, could you share with our viewers the process of redistricting? Uh, what principles govern it? You know, some of us may not be fully and un understand the process and and how it works. Well, uh, in it works differently in different in different states, but in in most states, uh, ultimately the legislature has a very significant role in 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 the process. In Massachusetts, um, the there is a joint legislative committee. We have a joint committee on redistricting, and that but that really is functioning as two different committees. Basically, we have a House side and a Senate side. So the House side is focused on drawing the House of Representative boundaries and the Senate side is focused on drawing the Senate boundaries. And so we really work mostly within the Senate about the Senate boundaries. And then together we're working on the Governor's Council and the congressional boundaries now. And and, and you also co-chaired the Special Joint Committee on Redistricting. Um, Correct, correct. So I co-chair that, I, I lead that from the Senate side. And so I've been, very focused on the Senate redistricting for the past few months, especially, but all over the last few years, um, it, it's it's a it's a deep area legally and, and politically and um, empirically. So it's been it's been a fascinating mm -hmm. effort. Mm -hmm. uh, in this process, I, I believe you also sought help from various advocacy groups like the New Democracy uh, Coalition, the Drawing Democracy Coalition, um, and probably even some. A broad public input was also sought. Can you share? Yes, that? thank you. No, so that was a very, very big part of what we did was we worked to make as many people aware of what we were doing as possible and to, to solicit as broad input as possible. And we did hear from hundreds and hundreds of people uh, across the state. And we worked, as you said, with uh, a number of organizations. Mm -hmm. um, there were two sort of principal groups. There was a there was there was a statewide group called the uh, drawing Democracy Coalition, and that brings together some of the, the statewide organizations that tend to be focused on voting issues like the ACLU, Lawyers for Civil Rights, a um, number of other groups, Voter Table, um, and, and they also have good networks out into a lot of the communities across the state, so they helped, they helped bring people into the process. And then we also spent a lot of time with um, the New Democracy Coalition, as opposed to the Drawing Democracy Coalition, which is a, a, a group that's more centered in Boston and more centered in the black community. And that was an important part of our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, would you say for future, looking in the next 10 years, um, 
what are some might be some of the lessons where uh, your hope or the joint committee's hope might have been that the public might have engaged a little bit more or a little bit more differently? Um, any advice on the community at large? Um, you know, because some of these things get lost uh, unless you are keeping an eye on the census being released. So I'm just curious if you have any advice for the community on uh, for future census results, how to make sure that they are engaged and that their voice is heard. Well, you know, it's always a process to to engage people. That's always that's this really the central challenge of government, right? Is to is to make sure that citizens are engaged and know what's going on and uh, are participating. And and you know, if, if we're going to have a democracy, a government of the people, uh, you know, by the people, of the people, for the people, yes. you know, people have to be engaged. And so that's all. That's always the central challenge, and I think I think it's one that's very familiar to to public officials. That you know you, you mm -hmm. reach out to people in as many ways as you can, and um, some people pay attention, and, and and some people you know you you don't reach in the right way. Um, but I think we got in this process. We got um, we got a lot of input, and I I think we. What one of the other things we can do is you know you listen to elected officials, and we certainly pay attention to elected officials as as people who whose job it is to also listen to their constituents. And so we, we hear from, through them, we also hear of, of um, where, where, where people are, what people are thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, could you explain, Senator, the concept of uh, majority minority opportunity district? Sure. Um, here's, here's the, here's the um, um, thing, here's the challenge in, in redistricting. Really, there are, um, it's kind of a tightrope, a legal tightrope uh, that that you that you need to walk. Um, and I've, it, it, I, I, I think on the one hand, let's talk about the law. The most the, we fought a civil war in this country mm -hmm. uh, to establish the principle that all men are really created equal, and that includes everybody, and that you the, are the our laws will not discriminate based on race uh, or um, language, you know, language preference. And um, so that's a very, very deep American legal principle that we don't segregate based on housing. We don't segregate housing. We don't segregate schools. And by the way, we don't segregate legislative districts. We don't district based on race. We don't put people of one ethnicity or one color in one district and sort them out that way. So racial sorting is unconstitutional in, 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 in the United States. Um, at the same time, however, we have to be aware that uh, sometimes the way districts are drawn can deprive uh, particular minorities of the candidate to of the ability to elect the candidates of their choice. And um, so we there's a whole legal framework for determining when that might be occurring. And in that case, we may engage in like, like racial sorting to, to fix that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a sort of a daunting thing when you first face it to say, you know, don't do it, but do it. Uh, but in fact, once you, the Supreme Court really has given us some very clear guidance as to, you know, how and when uh, one should be take, take race into consideration in the redistricting process. And basically, one is only supposed to do that uh, when uh, there is a minority that's been deprived of their ability to elect the candidate of their choice. And there's a three-part de test for determining that. Number one, first of all, is there a minority that's uh, large enough within a geographic area that they could constitute a district? Mm -hmm. So you have to have 50% plus one of the eligible voters in an area being of a particular minority. In the case of Boston, uh, that would be, there is a 50% plus one population of black voters um, that um, exists in a compact way in the city of Boston. Then you have to ask the question, well, do they vote as a block? Do they have a choice as a group? Or, and so then you have to, and, and to determine that, you have to look through past voting uh, patterns and see uh, how votes came out in particular precincts. And from that infer whether or not there was a black uh, voters candidate of choice. Okay, if that's the case, then the last step is, well, do, do the other voters, do, Perhaps, you know, generally, let's say the white voters, do they vote the other way in such a way as to deny the ability of that candidate to elect, of, the, of, the, of that a black potential majority to 
elect the candidate of their choice. So um, that's a very that's a, all that's very data intensive political process where you, we engage in a very searching practical inquiry as to whether in fact the, a particular group is being denied the candidate of their choice. And in Massachusetts, we we started with a clean slate in this redistricting round. We didn't pay attention to existing districts. Um, for the purposes of this analysis, for the purposes of this analysis, we said, OK, look, forget about districts, forget about town boundaries, forget about everything. Where in the state are there populations uh, who are sufficiently in size to, to constitute a majority? So we said in Boston, there's a black majority we found in Lawrence. There's an Hispanic majority. I mean, I said Lawrence. I really mean the Merrimack Valley right around that area. Lawrence, Methuen, Haverhill. There's a Hispanic population that's significant. And then out in Springfield, there's also an Hispanic population that's significant, but that's a little different because you already have an Hispanic uh, senator elected there. Uh, but we determined that there were two areas where, in fact, voters were being deprived of their choice. And we built a black majority district in Boston, and excuse me, a black, it is a black majority district, um, but actually, you know, let me back up. It, it actually isn't, it's right on the edge in terms of numerical majority, but it's sufficiently black that they will be able to elect the candidate of their choice. Mm -hmm. And the same in, in, um, in, in Lawrence, in Lawrence, uh, Methuen, Haverhill. So those are the two, what I would call section two ability to elect districts, section two of the Voting Rights Act, meaning, you know, mm -hmm. we've got to make sure that people are able to elect the candidates of their choice. We've done that in uh, two districts. Majority minority concept is really, not so much a legal concept um, or, you know, the opportunity concept is it's sort of a um, it's, it's a label of, it's a positive label that we're giving to districts that happen to have a majority minority. They may not be um, sufficient. When, when they may not be sufficiently of any particular minority to elect any particular candidate of, of, of choice, but overall they're, they're more diverse than the non-Hispanic white population is less than 50%. And, those are districts which there's not a, a, a generally a particular legal obligation to create those, but in fact, out of traditional redistricting principles or out of pres preservation of uh, patterns, we we have a total now of uh, four more of those. So we have a we have the two ability to elect district, and we have the four opportunity districts, if you will. Okay, thank you, thank you for explaining. Long, long answer. I, I uh, no, no, this is good. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a deep subject. It is. And so thank you for succinctly putting it for us. Um, pandemic has been challenging on many accounts and I, it's people's understanding that it has also presented challenge for completing the census. Um, acting Mayor Kim Jenny has questioned the total count of Boston resid residents, the total count that has been reported. And also earlier this month, two analyses reports said that the 2020 census shows that the Black Americans have been significantly undercounted, uh, more so in the past. Um, I wonder if there, uh, you, how would you respond to that? And if it's indeed true, are there any steps that have been taken or will be taken to address the issue? Well, uh, we made a significant investment in Massachusetts in attempting to make sure that everybody was counted. And there were, there were a lot of outreach um, done, uh, part of it state funded to communities that are quote unquote hard to count. That's the phrase, right? The census has a process where the, the, the communities that are easy to count are the ones where everybody, they get a, they get a card in the, uh, in the mail and they go, hey, census. And they go online and they fill out their census form and it's done. Um, and, and then they don't fill that out. Then they send them a, a letter, another, you know, full letter and ask them to fill it out on, on paper. If they don't do that, then they knock on their door. So the hard to count communities are the communities where, um, for whatever reason, people don't respond to email, people don't respond to, to, to letters. People have to go out and count them. They have to go back multiple times. Somebody comes to the door, doesn't want to talk to the census taker. Those are hard to count communities. So we made a lot of effort to make sure that, um, People knew as much about the census, they would be trusting, they'd be willing to come out and engage. And the results in Massachusetts overall for the total count were more than anybody thought. I mean, we, we've had uh, census projections going on through the, through the decade. The, there's a population estimates program uh, that put the population in Massachusetts around 6.8, 6.9 million. It came in over seven. Mm -hmm. So overall, 
I don't I don't think most of us who are sort of looking at the at the big picture think that there was a substantial undercount in Massachusetts. There might have been pockets of it, but uh, not only was the uh, count higher than anybody expected, but it also was high in communities that are hard to count. So, for example, in the Lawrence area, there was a substantial uh, growth in the um, Hispanic population that was more than anybody expected. So I, answer number one, I don't have a sense that there was a significant undercount in Massachusetts. Um, and two, there's nothing to do about it now. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any viable lawsuit that's going to change the numbers or change the game anyhow. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not focused on that at this point. Okay. Um, so then looking forward, when will the redistricting be implemented? What's the timeline for that? So the, the, the laws that we put in place now will govern the reelection of candidates in, in November, you know, in the, in the 2022 statewide election season. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then what do you want to tell your constituents who won't be part of your district anymore? I wonder if you had any uh, uh, message for them who have uh, uh, appreciated all the work that you have done for them, and but uh, you are no longer there. Uh, well, listen, I, no, it's been a privilege to represent uh, Back Bay, um, which is the major neighborhood that I'm losing. And uh, I'm very affectionate to that neighborhood. I, I went to high school in that neighborhood. I love the Back Bay. And so I'm, I'm sorry to lose them. But uh, hopefully uh, the, the many friends that I made uh, during 10 years of rep representing that area are, are friends that I'll be able to keep. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add uh, on this topic, Senator, before we sign off? Uh, you know, I, I just... I think that it's a difficult process. Not everybody can be happy in the process, um, but really we worked very hard to hear everybody's concerns and above all else to really follow the law and uh, implement it on all, all of its facets. We, we did, there was nothing that we took lightly about how we did this process. And uh, I think I think we've got a good final product, and I think that it will stand up over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Senator Brownsberger, for being with us today. Very much appreciate your time. Thank you. Glad to be with you. This was a special edition of Belmont Journal, Belmont's news and community update. And I'm your host, Shonul Malik, signing off. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.